Hey, thank you so much for joining in with us today. So glad that you did. We are in part three of our series, Breathing Room. And uh, we have been wanting to go through this uh, series as we slowly, and isn't it seem like it's taking forever to come out of this quarantine? And I know, I am so ready um, to just uh, get back together and looking forward to that. But if you missed part one or part two, you can go to our website, thecrossingfellowship.com, and you can catch up there, or you can catch us on our Facebook page or even our YouTube channel, and would love it if you would like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel and catch up with us there. But we have been going through this uh, uh, series of breathing room and uh, and and wanting to not come back to the way things were before we went into this, what, let's call it a timeout. We, we all have taken a huge timeout, and we're ready to get back in the game. But if we're going to get back in the game, there's some things that we should probably change because we have all been running way, way, way too fast. And creating breathing room, we were created to have breathing room in our lives. And so, you know, week one, we talked about our schedules. Last week, we talked about time. And, and breathing room is this space between our current pace and our limits. The, the, the pace in which we're clipping along in our schedules, we're clipping along in the view of how, of how we're using our time. And today we're going to talk about um, breathing room in regards to our finances. Now, sit back down in your lazy chair. I'm not going to, this is not a giving message. There, there isn't, when we get to the end of this, this is not a, uh, there's no gotcha. There, there's no ask. I don't want anything from you. But I do want something for you. Because as we clip along, uh, we learned last week, you know, yes, our time is limited. Therefore, we have to limit what we do with our time. But your money is also limited, but you don't have to limit what you do with your money. Because as you can't, you know, borrow time, you can borrow money, right? And it gets us into all kinds of trouble, and we tend to want to spend just as much as we take in, and it causes financial pressure, and it causes relational tension. And, uh, and here's the thing, if you're watching this and you're not a Jesus follower, don't believe in the Bible, you know, you can apply what we're going to talk about today, and you know what, It'll, you will be better off for it. But you can pick and choose if you want to do it or not do it. But if you're watching this and you're a Jesus follower, and, and th- there isn't a choice for us. Th- there, is, there is a relationship between calling Jesus our Lord and creating breathing room, creating space, creating margin, and ordering our financial world. There is a relationship. There is a relation. It is connected. The, the two aren't disconnected. They are connected. There is a relationship between making Jesus Lord, big Bible word, and getting your financial house in order. And it has nothing really to do with your giving. It has everything to do with creating breathing room. See, your culture, our culture, wants to tell you and wants to, to sell something to you that says, you know what? A standard of living equals the quality of your life. Your standard of living equals your quality of life. The greater the standard of living that you have, the greater the quality of life you have. And isn't that why we push and we push and we push and we push and we push and, and we try to, to, to get as much as we possibly can and gain as much as we possibly can and leverage as much as we possibly can? Because we believe that the, the greater our standard of living, the greater our quality of life. And yet, I know personally that this isn't necessarily true. In fact, I know personally it's not true. And I know others who have experienced that, you know what, they've made more, they're making more than they have ever made before. And yet, They have more relational tension. They have more relational conflict. They have more stress. 
They have more worry. They have, they have you know, a less quality of life than they have ever had before. These two are not going in the same direction. You see, you can raise your standard of living with debt, but you raise your quality of life with discipline. And in America, we like debt more than we like discipline. And so we just keep going after it and keep going after it and keep going after it. I mean, I, I, I know some married couples who, you know, they, they honestly, they, they, they have a horrible marriage. They, they, they don't really necessarily even like one another. But they're driving really nice cars. I mean, they, they have an incredible, they have all the stuff. It's, it's like a race to have the biggest and the best and the fastest and the slickest and the, you know, the coolest and, and all the stuff. And Isn't it true? I mean, you wives, you, you, you see your husband come home and you don't even really want to see him. And, he, and so, I mean, he's pulling in the drive and you're kind of trying to hide and avoid and he's pulling in. He kind of knows that you're probably hiding and trying to avoid, and he doesn't even really want to see you either. But you got really cool cars. So way to go. See, this is a lie. And this is a lie that your culture is trying to sell you. And right now, I think, in this t- great big time out in and, and for some of us, you know, it may be even exposing some of the, the financial pressure because this time, you know, it, it's pushing on us in, in financial ways. I hope that coming out of it, we will decide to create breathing room. Because see, creating breathing room financially, it may lower your standard of living. And I know, <laughs> this is America, we... We don't do that. But it may raise your quality of life. See, here's what I know about you. Here's what I know about you. You are living on a percentage of your income. Yeah, I, I know. None of you are like, oh, I'm writing that down. I'm a li- I am living on a... Per- what? Yeah, you're living on a percentage of your income. Probably 100% of your income, right? And you're just like, well, th- that's what we do in America. We just... I mean, have you actually decided what percentage of your income you're going to live on? Have you decided? You're like, well, no. I mean, no one's even asked that question. If you don't take anything else out of today, I hope that you will take that. That you should decide what percentage of your income you're actually going to live on. Instead of just assuming that you're going to live on 100% of your income. The other thing I know about you is you and I both believe, and it doesn't really even matter how much money you make, if you ask someone who makes all kinds of money, you're like, how, how much would be enough? They would probably tell you just a little bit more. Isn't it true? I mean, it doesn't even really matter how much money you make. I mean, if I just had a little bit more, then it, it, that would make all the difference in the world. If I just made a little bit more. The other thing I know about you is you felt the same way when you made a lot less. See, I, re- I remember early on, early on in, in the, my, when I was a, for, uh, a youth pastor for the first time, and I was making $18,000 a year, and I thought, man, I mean, if I made 30, if I made 30, <laughs> I didn't even know what I would do with all that money. Isn't it true? And then, you're, and then you make 50 and you're like, man, if I could make 50, oh, man, I, I would be so set. And now you're making 50 and you're thinking, you know, if I made 75, if I made 75, I mean, really, I can't think of anything else I could do. And, and now you're making 75, you're making 100, and you're, and you're thinking, you know, if I just made, you know, if I just made a little bit more, then, I mean, those guys who are making 150, <laughs> what do they do with all that money? See, um, here's the thing, and 
maybe maybe if if you're a visual learner, this will this will help you to to see it on a graph. So here's our money, and here's our time. And over time, generally, our income gets bigger and bigger. Now it may not be thousands; it may be hundreds. And and I realize that you know uh, this isn't necessarily the way you know our income you know raises. But uh, for the sake of our, of, uh, of our illustration, it's going to continue on. And I realize you go up for a while and then, you know, you dive off and back up. And some of you are just like, I mean, you streamlined. You're t- yeah. But for the sake of our illustration, over time, generally, your income raises as you gain more and more experience. But here's the thing. Our income, our, our income if it's raising like this, you know, the goal, if we have decided a percentage of our income that we're going to live on, our spending is down here. If we're continuing to say that, that the goal is to have a quality of life, not a, a standard of living, and the two are not equal. A, standard of, a greater sta- standard of, of living doesn't equal a greater quality of life. I'm going to create in this space, in this space, we call this breathing room. This is a great place to live. There is way less worry right here. There is way less anxiety right here. There there is way less relational tension right here. There is way less financial tension right here. Because when there's a bump, and there's going to be a bump, and when there's, you know, a pandemic, and who knows whenever there's going to be a pandemic and get, but I guarantee you there's going to be small things and maybe even big things that come along, a job loss. When there's breathing room, it doesn't have near the negative impact on us as it does when there is no breathing room. Because here's the thing. Here's where we usually live in America. Our income and our spending tracks right along with it. And it doesn't matter how much you make, it just keeps on, you know what, tracking right with us. And in fact, in fact, the more you make, the more stressful it becomes. The, the, the more financial stress you actually have. Because you become aware, as, as you get farther and farther up this graph, when you're down here and you have, you know, a $40,000 a year job, $50,000 a year job, you know, you, you might be able to go and find another one of those. But you get out here and you're in that $150,000, $250,000 job, those are few and far in between. And so if you're spending, is tracking your income, and if you lose that job, oh, 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 oh the pressure and the financial stress that comes with it. It is why it is impossible to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus and live this way. And then all of a sudden, uh uh-oh, uh-oh. What happens then all of a sudden our spending is outpacing our income? Uh Uh-oh. Then all of a sudden, we have all kinds of tension. All kinds of relational tension. All kinds of worry. All kinds of anxiety. All kinds, I mean, it will affect you so, so deeply emotionally that it will actually begin to affect you physically. And you become a slave. You become a slave to worry. You become a slave to insecurity. And what does Jesus say? He says, don't worry. But you have put yourself in a place where that's all you can do is worry. And that's why Jesus is saying, I want you to come back from there. You weren't created to live there. And and, and he talks so much about money. You become a slave to insecurity. You become a slave to relational tension. You become a slave to to no peace in your life. You become a slave to blame. Somebody else's fault, 
It's the president's fault. It's the previous president's fault. It's the government's fault. It's everybody else's fault. It's my employer's fault. You're just going to blame. You become a slave to irresponsibility and not being disciplined. That's, maybe that's why Jesus talked so much more about money than really anything else. He talked way more about money than he did about heaven. And yet he never asked for money. It wasn't about giving. It was about our perspective on money and our view of it and how we handled it, whether we thought it was all for us to consume or whether we thought, you know what, God has placed it all in our hands to manage for him. And so he says at the Sermon on the Mount, in his most famous sermon in Matthew 6, verse 19, and if you open your Bibles, if you have those, I'd encourage you to open them. If, if you have your phone and the Bible app, the version, I would highly encourage you to, t- you to download the version Bible app on your phone. And uh, we're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Don't store up treasures here on earth. Keyword, I'm storing, I'm, I'm, I'm acting, I'm believing, I'm thinking that, that this is the, the final, this is it. This is all there is. So I'm thinking there's birth and there's death and everything has to happen in between and there's nothing beyond this life. So I'm going to store everything I can. I'm going to believe that my standard of living is going to be equal to my quality of life. So I'm going to make as much standard of living so I can have as much quality of life as I can possibly have in this life because that's all there is. And I'm going to store it all here. Jesus says, Matthew records what Jesus says. He says, where moths eat them, Rust destroys them, and thieves break in and steal. In other words, they're going to go away. But if you had your choice between storing up your treasure in a place where it didn't go away for eternity or in a place where it was guaranteed it would go away, where would you store it? And so he says, guys, store up your, your treasures in heaven. Well, Jesus, we don't live in heaven. How, what are you talking about? How can we store up our treasure in heaven? And it, it comes back to this same idea that we talked about in our money series where you can't take it with you. You can't take anything with you when you die, but you can send it on ahead. And it is, it is being in a place where you realize that God has placed everything into your hands And I'm living with margin in my life. So when God asks me to do something, I could be generous. I can can do that because I have margin. He says, so store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. It's preserved forever. And thieves do not break in and still. And then he just kind of gets right to the to the meat and the heart. He says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be. If you want to follow how your heart is doing, follow where you're investing in your treasures. If you want to see whether you're actually being a fully devoted follower of Jesus, then track where you're storing your treasure. Woo! Oh man, that's that's tough, isn't it? That's tough for me to hear. It's tough for every American to hear. And then Jesus goes into some verses that a couple of verses that seem completely irrelevant to the conversation. I mean, it just seems like okay, we just took a left turn, and Jesus does what he does. And and they're kind of they're a little bit hard uh, verses. So I'm going to give you my best crack at uh, these couple of verses. All right, here we go. Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. Your eye is something that you see with. It's, it, it's your perspective. It's, it's the way you see it. It's the lens in which you see it through. And your eye, Jesus says, is a lamp. 
The way you see it lights something up. The way you perceive it, the way you, your perspective on it provides light for your body. When your eye is good, in other words, when you see it right, and honestly, when you see it the way the author of life has made it to work, so when you see it the way that Jesus sees it, when you see it the way God sees it, when your perspective on your finances, when your perspective on your treasures is the same as what Jesus sees it and views it, when your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. In other words, even your physical body is affected. You don't have the tension going on in here. When there is breathing room in your finances, there, there is so much peace that happens inside of you. There is way less worry. There is way less anxiety. There is way less that we're dealing with on the inside and relational tension and everything that goes along. He says, but when your eye is bad, when you see it the wrong way, when you don't view it the way God's made it to work, your whole body is filled with darkness. It brings about this conflict and this tension and this no peace and this wrestling and, 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 and this, this stuff inside of us that just, it's just dark. We don't know what to do with it. And then he says something, and I'm telling you, <clears throat> this is, this is a, a hard teaching. And it is for every single one of you who have been following Jesus for a long, long time, and you think you got it all figured out. You think you got it all figured out, and if you were going to peel back the layers, you think, you think there's a way to fully be a, a fully devoted follower of Jesus and continue to, to, you know what, believe that you can raise your standard of living and that equals raising your quality of life. You think those two, you can manage those two things. You can have both. And you can bring them to their end. And you've got it all figured out. And, and so you're just you're trying to, to, to have a, a foot in both of those worlds. And he says, and if the light you think you have, I think I have it. I think I've got it figured out. Thank you very much, preacher man. But I think I can handle this. And you know what? I'm going to continue to store my, I'm not really storing my treasure. <laughs> I sort of am, but I think I, I think I can manage both. I think I can manage the outcomes of both. If, you, if the light you think you have is actually darkness, you're not actually seeing it right. And you're deceiving yourself, and you're thinking, and you're playing the game, and you think it's light. But it's not light. It's darkness. How deep that darkness is. Jesus is saying, you are in a very deep, deep pit. You are in a dangerous place. And that is for us Jesus followers who want to live in both of those worlds. And maybe that's why he says in the next verse, no one can serve two masters. You can't. In fact, you hate it. You hate it when you have two masters, right? When, when you have two different people telling you what to do, and you're just like, okay, which one of those am I going to do? You will hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and the devil. No. <laughs> Isn't that what we would expect Jesus to say? You can't serve God and the devil. No. Nope. Jesus says you can't serve both God and money. You cannot have those two masters at the same time. Crossing, everyone who is watching this, you, Jesus followers, if you're not following Jesus, you, you can pick and choose as much of this or as little of this as you want. But if you're following Jesus, I'm telling you, you cannot be a fully, you cannot fully follow Jesus when your financial world is not 
in order. And here's why. Because Jesus says, don't worry. And because of your finances, that's all you do is worry. You can't fully follow because when Jesus puts something on your heart to fund, you can't fund it. Because your income is going this way and your spending is tracking right along with it. Jesus wants us to one another one another. But you can't fully follow because that's impossible when, when financially, when, when, when your spending is tracking your income, you have so much financial pressure. Where is your focus? Your focus is on you. It's impossible for us to one another one another to, to, to see and meet the needs of others when our financial world is so tight that we have to focus on just ourselves. So don't be driven by a standard of living. Instead, be driven by a quality of life. And do not confuse the two. So here's what I would love for you to do. you got to decide. At some point, I, I realize it's like, well, that's kind of a lame step. I, I, I understand. It's kind of a lame step. But at some point, you just got to decide. And what better time to decide when you're in the middle of a pandemic and you are seeing maybe the reason why Jesus is saying, I want financial breathing room for you. So now's the great time to decide, you know what? I have fallen for what the culture has fed me. I ain't doing it anymore. I am deciding to make some changes. So here's what I would love for you to do. I would love for you to sign up for Financial Peace University this summer. We, we are going to be bringing it to you this summer, okay? Now, we don't have the exact date set down because of all of the guidelines, but it is coming, and it's coming soon, and when it comes, you just be ready. So if you're like, well, Eric, I want to do something in, in the meantime, so here's what I would suggest for you to do. I would suggest for you to buy Financial Peace Revisited by Dave Ramsey. You're like, Eric, I don't have enough money to buy Financial Peace Revisited. Um, so, okay, then go to the bookstore. Go to the bookstore and get Financial Peace Revisited, pull it off the shelf, and turn to Chapter 8 and start reading and, at, at page 67. Okay, you could just read it. You're like, Eric, I don't, I don't have the time for that. Okay. Here you go. You can just go to the bookstore. You find Financial Peace Revisited. You take it off the shelf. You turn to page 90 and 91. You take a picture with your cell phone that you can't afford on both of those. And you just read those. And then when you get out of debt, then you can go back and actually buy the book and apply it to your life. You see, I want you to decide. I want you to sign up for financial peace. I want you to set a percentage of income that you are going to live on. Come up with a number. Are you going to live on 90%? Are you going to live on 85%? Are you going to live on 95%? What's the percentage of your income you're going to live on? Because here's the truth. The chief competitor for your heart and my heart is your stuff. It's your money. It's your finances. And it tends to become the master of our heart. Does Jesus have your heart? Or does your stuff? Who are you following as Jesus followers? Let's create breathing room into our financial worlds. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time. And God, I just pray, this is, this is hard. There's, 
There's people early on in their in their lives who are just kind of getting traction financially. And God, I just pray that they would they would take a hold of this and they would make decisions early, early on to be disciplined. And God, they would be razor focused on a quality of life and realize that that does not mean a greater and greater standard of living. The two are not equal. So God, I pray that you would help us to believe the truth. You would help us to follow you fully. And God, that we would, we would reap what you want because you love us. You love us so much you don't want us to experience all of the, the junk and the stuff that comes with financial pressure. So God, I pray that you would help people and give them the courage to decide today. In Jesus' name, amen.